coming up on this week's GCN Racing News Show, seven things we learned from yesterday's Ronda Fun Flandern. Two great races, two thoroughly deserving winners, and three disqualifications. One of those was incredibly controversial. The days of a fan getting a bottle from a rider as a souvenir seem to be over. We've also got the Grand Prix Miguel Indurain, Dwarsdorf Landren, and a public spat between Peter Sagan and his team. First up though, seven things we learnt from the men's and women's tours of Flanders. This year, it is the only spring cobble classic after that postponement of Paris-Roubaix until October. More on that later. But the first thing we learnt is that Kasper Asgreen is the king of the cobbles this spring. There's no doubt about this one. You cannot argue with me on it. Uh, he won E3 in amazing solo fashion. He won yesterday in a similarly exciting manner, beating Mathieu van der Poel in a sprint. He went toe to toe with the Dutch champion, pulling turns until just one kilometer remained. He backed himself when most of us were thinking he was foolish to do so. But he was right to do so. I mean, Van der Poel probably couldn't believe his luck when Asgreen kept pulling through to keep the chasing group at bay, but he would have been even more in disbelief when Asgreen kicked and not only drew alongside him, but went past. Talk about ripping the script up. Uh, here's what Asgreen had to tell us after his amazing win. Going into the last kilometer, we still had a bit more than 30 seconds. So uh, I decided to, to stay in the wheel. And uh, even though we slowed down, we still had a, a, a bit of gap to play with. Uh, and then uh, I could control when, when I wanted to open the sprint and, uh, and uh, just uh, go from there. What does mean this victory for you? I mean, you have been already in good places here. But this year you win Harold Beck, you win here. It's a big step forward. Yeah, it's been an incre incredible uh, classic season this year and uh, I'm, uh, I'm so happy uh, with how uh, we rode as a team in, uh, in both those races and uh, yeah, it's been, uh, it's been amazing. Great stuff. Uh, right on to number two then. If Asgreen is the king of the cobbles, Van Flurten is the current queen of them and indeed the queen of training. Yesterday marked just her fourth day of racing in 2021 and along with her win at Dwarsdorf Landon on Wednesday, it means she's currently got a 50% strike rate this season. The way she does it is just dominant, isn't it? On Wednesday, she was away with Cassia Nubia Doma, launched a sprint from what I thought was way too far out, but she just beasted it all the way to the line. It wasn't even close in the end. And then yesterday, she didn't so much attack on that final climb of the Paterberg. She just rode everybody off her wheel. The world champion, Anna van der Breggen, along with Brenauer, Brown, Uttrup Ludwig and all the rest. And then even eight against one on that flat run-in was no trouble for Annemiek van Fleurten, who sailed home to victory 10 years since her only other victory at that race. On to number three then. Van der Poel is better at poker than we thought. Or is he? His lacklustre performance at Dwarsdorf Landen on Wednesday, where he was dropped like a ton of bricks on the Cote de Trieu, left us all wondering if his form had nosedived from 10,000 feet to below sea level in the space of just a few days. However, yesterday he proved that, although he might be slightly past his peak, he's certainly not too far away from it. He just came up against a man in the form of his life. Van der Poel will now take a break to recharge his batteries before resuming competition on the road, at least, in June at the Tour de Suisse. The fourth thing we learned yesterday is that Grace Brown is just about to take a very big win in her career. She really is a star, this woman. She was a late starter in the world of pro cycling, or just cycling for that matter. As she started out as a runner, switched her attention to cycling, quickly rose up the ranks before turning pro in the latter half of 2018. Now, last year, she really came of age with that great win at Brabant's Appeal, then almost catching Lizzie Diagon at Liège Baston Liège. This year, she's already won the OxyClean de Brugge Classic, a fine sprint then saw her finish third yesterday. So watch out for her at Liège Baston Liège. We also learnt that Wout van Aert is human. He can win bunt sprints, he can win time trials, he can win cobbled classics, but he has displayed the odd weakness in between all those spectacular performances. Yesterday, on our post-race show on GCN Plus, Cy asked Magnus Bagstedt if he thought he might be spreading himself too thinly given everything he's currently focusing on. Here's what he had to say in response. Okay, he, he's a super domestique in the high mountains. He's a sprinter in the Grand Tours. Um, he rides cyclocross like a few other. Um, and at, what, at some point you've got to sort of find that one thing that you specialise in and you become really, really good at. And I think classics racing and sprinting in the Grand Tours kind of work together and go hand in hand. But 
the moment you've got to start looking at, I kind of want to become a GC rider and, uh, and I'm going to start being that sort of super domestique in the high mountains that he just kind of found himself in that position last year, then that's when I think the, the classics racing will potentially start taking a bit of a hit. Yeah, we better warn him after he finishes first at the Tour de France this year that he's spreading himself a bit thin. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Just stay exactly as you are, Wout. We love watching you race. And now we also learnt yesterday that whilst the Kern and Quickstep are dominant, Jumbo Visma and Alpecin Fenix rode a fantastic race. Now they've come in for a lot of criticism from various people, myself included, in not being there to support their leaders when it really matters in the biggest one-day races. However, yesterday, despite the guards' early disqualification, Alpes and Fenix were often present at the front of the race, and Gianni Vermeers even nabbed a top 10 for himself. Similarly, Jumbo Visma had riders following the moves made by Elegant Quickstep, as they were known yesterday, and were also drilling it on the front for Van Aert before some of the key moments of the race. Hats off to you all, and hats off to Martin Vinans, who called time in his career yesterday after 16 and a half years as a pro. All the best for retirement, Martin. And finally, we learnt that the UCI were not joking when they said they'd be clamping down on the rules old and new. So we had three disqualifications yesterday. The first two came from the same incident, Otto Vigada and Yevgeny Fedorov involved in an altercation near the start of the race. Fedorov appeared to hit the brakes in frustration at not being able to get away from the bunch. A dangerous move, but then Vigada retaliated by violently swinging across the road. Both were subsequently taken out of the race, and I, for one, thought that was a good decision by the UCI. That was not acceptable behaviour, and that is not what we want young viewers to be thinking is acceptable either. A few kilometres down the road, though, there was a much less controversial incident, and therefore a more controversial disqualification. Mikhail Scher of Agi Désert Citroën, waiting for his team car after another mechanical, threw his bottle to some spectators stood at the side of the road. Nothing abnormal about that, except for the fact that this is now banned under UCI rules, which came into place on April the 1st. It's deemed as littering. Now, I did think I had read that the UCI had said this rule would be applied with discretion, i.e. if it's not dangerous and it's not littering because somebody in the crowd will pick it up, then no action would be taken. However, action was taken and Cher was removed from the race. Harsh, I think is the word we could use to describe that decision. Now, I would be the first person to condemn any sort of littering in races, but in my mind, it wasn't the case here. Uh, Andre Greipel also weighed in on this matter on Twitter, replying to Sportser. He said, It is getting ridiculous, UCI cycling. Rules are rules, but these things have to be changed. Riders are dedicating all wins to prepare for the classics, and this situation was clearly not necessary to put a rider out of the race. And I'm inclined to agree. I really hope this is not a sign of things to come. Seeing the smile on the face of a child who has passed a bottle by one of the stars of the pro peloton always puts a smile on my face. It means a lot, and it's something that some people treasure forever. If it's a dangerous bead on the throw that endangers other riders, or if it's away from spectators and outside a litter zone, yes, that's not on. But please, let's just have a bit of common sense when deciding on any potential sanction within a race. Or maybe you disagree with me. If you do, or you don't, you can let me know not only in the comments section down below, but also in our poll that we put up on the GSIN app yesterday. You'll be able to find a link to that on your screen right now, or indeed in the description below this video. Now, speaking of UCI rules, the Super Tuck ban finally came into force last Thursday on April the 1st, and it wasn't a joke. It's a thing of the past. So who better to give us one last beautiful shot of that position than the man that made it famous, Matty Mohoric of Bahrain Victorious. Rest in peace indeed. Right, just before we move on, a quick look at what's coming up this week on GCM Plus. And despite there being no Paris-Roubaix, we've still got a lot to look forward to. Starting today, in fact, with the Tour of the Basque Country, or Izulia Pay Vasco, uh, which will see Tadej Pogacar and Primoz Roglic lock horns again for the first time in a stage race since last year's incredible Tour de France battle. Uh, both have shown fantastic form already this season and will start as clear favourites, but they will face stiff competition from Ineos Grenadiers, amongst others. They've got both Adam Yates and Richard Carapaz in their lineup, and Mikel Lander will also be there, as will Alejandro Valverde and a whole 
heap of other climbing talents. Uh, that race is available in all GCN Plus territories. And on Wednesday, more Belgian racing. It's the men's and the women's Skelda praise. The Sprinters Classic that does feature its own cobbled sectors, albeit not quite as severe as what we've seen over the past couple of weeks. Now that one does have more territory restrictions, so please check what's available where you are. But if you're in the right country, you'll be able to watch both the men's and women's races live. Uh, don't forget, we've also got the World of Cycling, which looks at the best of bike racing every single Wednesday. This week, Cy is going to be joined by our very own Connor Dunn, who is always thoroughly entertaining. Uh, also on GCN Plus this week, two more films, one of which is entitled Steel is Real. Uh, Reynolds Tubing has a long history in the bike industry and at races. In fact, it was the choice of Eddie Merckx back in his days dominating the sport. And this film follows Reynolds through the ages, looks at where they are now and their current manufacturing process. Here's a quick look at what you can expect. We've got 2,000 different tube options on file. They can make really, really stiff tubes that have really, really thin walls, so we can make really light bikes. We rode on steel bikes for around three years. The stiffness is really unique. With humble beginnings over 120 years ago, Reynolds has persevered and adapted. There were some major concerns about whether Reynolds would be able to survive. We are not actually competing with carbon fibre. We are now in a different kind of niche. The way steel and titanium ride, I really enjoy the feel of the tubes. Steel is coming back as a premium material. Great stuff. Moving on, Saturday saw the 33rd edition of the Grand Premier Miguel Indurain take place, and the older generation showed all the young guns they're not done yet. Luis Leon Sanchez of Astana was particularly active, away in a group that also included British champion Ben Swift, amongst others. In the group behind, well, here's Alejandro Valverde, waving at the camera and having a rather jolly day out in the saddle. And here he is, a couple of kilometres later, making a blistering attack to get away from the group he was in. He soon caught Sanchez, and even with another Astana rider, Alexei Lunsenko for company, there was nothing they could do to stop Valverde when he attacked on the brutally steep final climb. From that moment onwards, the result was really not in doubt. His first win since the stage of the 2019 Vuelta a España. Now, to put that win into some kind of context, he's older than me, which is really all you need to know. As I said on Twitter, getting out of bed without any aches and pains is really the only win you should be achieving at this point in your life. Uh, meanwhile, I have got to give a shout out to Dylan van Baal for his ride at Dwarsdorf Vlaanderen last Wednesday. He attacked a quality group of riders with 52 Ks remaining. And I'll hold my hands up, in commentary, I said I thought that was a foolish move. More for me, really, because Van Baal pulled off an incredible ride on the day to take the biggest win of his career so far, in my opinion. Uh, also taking his first win of this season yesterday in France was the French champion Arnaud Demar. He got the better of Nasser Buani, who is still racing, whilst the UCI Disciplinary Commission looked at that incident from one week ago. Uh, thanks, incidentally, for all your comments on that, by the way. I did read through as many as I could last week. There was a lot of debate around the rights and wrongs of what he did, that's for sure. Just a couple of other bits of news now. I've already mentioned the postponement of Paris-Roubaix, but I haven't mentioned the revised dates. Put them in your diary, because there are two of them, the 2nd and the 3rd of October this year. That's right, a Sunday in hell becomes a weekend in hell, with the women's race on the Saturday and the men's the following day. And I think that's a great move. It can be a bit of a marathon sitting through two races in the same day, particularly monuments like Paris Bay. Uh, now they've got their own breathing space though, and I honestly cannot wait. There are a number of high profile female pros retiring at the end of this year, and there is a big chance here for them to have the biggest swan song of them all. Uh, meanwhile, Peter Sagan was in the headlines last week after the manager of his team, Ralph Denk, insinuated that he thought the best of Sagan's career could be behind him and that he was prepared to build a team that didn't involve the three-time world champion. Uh, Sagan was very quick to hit back himself in the media, saying that if Denk doesn't believe in him, he'll be the first rider to go out and find a team that does. It'd be kind of weird, wouldn't it, having your work contract negotiations played out in the public eye? Speaking to Velo News, GCN said they think Dan Lloyd's best presenting days are behind him, and that actually, he was never really much good anyway. And on that bombshell, I shall bid you farewell. Cheers for watching. I look forward to seeing you all again very soon. At least I hope I will, if I'm still here. See you later.